Um, so I've given many, many talks um, across the nation uh, about my work, about protests, and I'm particularly nervous today because my mother is in the audience. Um, <laughs> so Sandra Lemberg. And so I told my 13-year-old my daughter, yes, she deserves an applause indeed. Um, I told my 13-year-old daughter yesterday that I was working, I had to work on a little talk today, um, and I was really nervous because grandma would be in the audience. And she said, um, she's your mother. She's going to love whatever you do, <laughs> um, which I thought was very wise for a 12-year-old. Um, OK, so let me see if this works. OK, so protests. What do sociologists think about protests? This is just to, s to show you that protest is not something that just was invented um, in the 20th century. This is the 19th century. This was the French occupation of Spain, uh, I think about 1806. Um, and you see, uh, you see protesters there saying, no, no, we don't, uh, we don't want you here. Um, we can move on. Just tell me, I want to show you a couple slides of protests. And I just want you to think about what you're seeing and then help me maybe with what we think a definition of protest is. So this is uh, uh, protest for AIDS. This is the Vietnam War. This is um, about immigration and racism. Tea Party. Anti-tax. Clean water. Okay, so what are some things that you see? What if you just to describe what a protest is based on these images, and they all kind of have some common elements. So what? People screaming. People screaming. So there's, uh, they're loud. They're noisy. People are, uh, are, are, are expressing themselves. What else do you see? Signs. There are signs, right? So they're very, uh, there's a kind of a performance aspect of protest. People, um, demonstrators are sort of, it's like theater. You're looking at theater. Um, anything else that you notice? Hmm? Youth? Protest often involves young people, um, which is a great question. We probably won't get at that, except maybe afterwards if you have more questions about why that might be the case. The Tea Party is an exception to that, and we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, anything else? Yeah. Frustration, right? Anger? Yeah. Okay, so it's group focus. Right, so people feel like there might be an injustice being done to the group that they consider themselves to be part of. And yes? A feeling of not being heard. Okay, so often uh, a sense of not being enfranchised or not being part of the power structure. So yes, these are all great, great things. The other thing I, I just point out, they're, they're asking for something, right? They want lower taxes, they want clean water. They want, um, they want non-discrimination policies. They want more research for AIDS. They're asking for something. So of, of government, right. So protests are mechanisms by which individuals working outside of the, former, for, the formal political institutions make demands on a higher authority, and that's typically government, right? There are examples of people protesting Walt Disney or corporations doing boycotts. That's a form of protest, but typically government is what our, uh, our frustrations are, are oriented around. And again, it's outside of formal political institutions, right? So this is, we typically think of protest as the way in which the powerless have a chance to try and create change in their society. So I'm also a scholar of creativity. So for me, protest is one of the most creative acts imaginable. Because it's people saying, OK, here's the way things are done. There's a formal process for grievances, a formal process for lobbying, for a, electoral office, uh, there's, a, there's a whole institutional structure of government that's providing us services, and I don't like it. It's not working for me. I'm irritated by it, I'm angry, and I'm going to use my creative energy to see if I can do something new. Yeah? Excellent. So 
Yeah, so protests also differ a great deal in their content and in their strategy and tactics. You're suggesting it's not always a, you could be strategically peaceful or strategically loud and angry, or that could be imposed on you by outsiders. You might intend to be peaceful and then it becomes, becomes violent. Um, so protests often involve public space, performance, spectacle, claims making, crowds, organized activity. So this is uh, another form of protest. Now when sociologists first began studying protests seriously in the 1940s and 1950s, this is what they were really worried about. They were worried about the angry mob. They were worried about the idea that protest is actually not part of democracy, it's actually a sign that there's a problem. That when people protest, it's because they're irrational, they're emotional, they're angry, they're hard to control, they're easily influenced. This was also, this concern was partly in response to what people were seeing in Europe around fascism and Hitler, the idea that a mob could easily be, uh, be ruled by, a, by an author authoritarian uh, government, a fascist government. Um, okay, so irrational, alienated, that's another point someone made, that protests come from people who have basically, uh, who feel like they have nothing to lose because, uh, because they're separated from society, they're not treated well, they're on the margins. Um, it's dangerous, it's angry, it's angry people. Um, so sociology moved on from this, and, uh, and we went from the idea that protest is a, is a mob phenomena to the idea that protest is part of what we would call uh, a social movement. It's about mobilizing people and, and, and money and attention in order to get things done. And it's not, a, it's not outside the political system. It's actually part and parcel of it. This is a way in which citizens um, come together through their affiliations and groups to make, uh, to make demands on their government. And it's, it's quite rational. It's quite strategic. It's quite tactical. Um, and so, you are, so scholars start trying to think about the process of, of, a, of a social protest or a protest movement. And that it unfolds over time. And it might start with a couple, uh, with, with a grievance and a set of organizations that decide to find some affiliation together to make their movement bigger. And then, then maybe some event happens that they react to and they go to the streets and then they try and mobilize and bring more people into the protest and get more public attention. And then they have a hierarchy of people who are planning the, the, the social movement and are deciding the best way forward and they come up with strategies and plans and they move forward slowly, incrementally over time to make a difference. And so that's the kind of protest that you guys have been studying over the course of this semester, right? The labor movement, um, the civil rights, right? These were, these were protests that went through stages, that were organized, that had, uh, had a sort of a rational calculation about how they were gonna make a difference in the world. Um, and this is what sociologists have really spent the most time studying, the traditional social movement and how it works, how it's organized, and how it makes a difference. Um, so they're goal-oriented. Social movements are goal-oriented. And success means basically getting access to economic resources or political resources, changing a law, getting the tax system to favor you. Um, and so that's what success is, right? We're strategic. We see our goal. We're going to go for it. It's an economic or political goal. And then we're going uh, uh, to mobilize to make it happen. Um, there's another way sociologists think about protests, which is the stuff that I do which is that protest is symbolic, right? And what does it mean for something to be symbolic? It, it means that it's not necessarily the, the, the money, the resources, the economics, or the political power that a protest is after. It's, so, it's a social power. It's the power of, of social esteem. That partly what we protest recognition. is recognition. We want to be recognized. We want others, we want our neighbors, our friends, the people we work with in our community to feel like our lifestyle, our choices, our values are worth something, right? That we're not marginalized. So social esteem, what others think of us, is really important. And protest is, is an important part of this. And he's just saying it's not enough to love each other. We have to admire each other as well. Oops. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about social esteem. 
and just give you some historical examples of protest around social esteem. Um, well, when do we need to have people reinforce that we're important? Let's just say, um, if anyone's raised a teenager, <laughs> you know, teenagers need you to tell them that, that, that they're, they're important, right? Self-esteem is huge for teenagers. And one of the reasons it is is because they're going through incredible transition, right? Their whole world is getting turned upside down. Um, they're not adults. They're not children. You know, who, who are they? What are they? What does society expect of them? How are things changing? Their bodies are changing. So they're going through all this change. Well, societies go through change too, right? So when societies go through dramatic changes, when things are, the social order is kind of being turned upside down, when everything seems up for grabs, that's when we specifically seek out affirmation that the things that we believe, our way of life still matters, that we still belong in the face of all this change. So in the, uh, in the 1920s, 1930s in America, there was a lot of um, social unrest. The old agrarian society was beginning to, um, uh, to change to a more industrial society. People were moving into the cities. Um, children were not just taking the jobs of their parents working on the farm. They were beginning to do, um, do their own thing. So there's a sense of indiv individualism that didn't exist before that. Um, there were, uh, there was, people were moving around. The church was losing its hold on values in the community. Um, people were really worried about young people moving into cities. You know, they were going to do bad things in cities. I mean, there was going to be crime, and there was increasing crime, but they were also going to do things like have sex, which was really scary, that all these young people unattached would be in a city together doing things that were inappropriate. Um, so there's all this social anxiety about what, uh, um, about, about sort of what were the dominant values. So someone, so Graham Crackers. This seems like an unusual slide to show with that context. Sylvester Graham was a minister, right? Graham Cracker, Crackers is, is named after Sylvester um, Graham. And he began the first natural foods movement in the 1930s, I mean 1830s, right? So right now, we're really big into eating well, eating organic, eating, eating brown food instead of white food, eating grainy food instead of processed food eating unenriched food rather than enriched food, like enriched flour food. This all started in the 1830s because uh, Sylvester Graham looked around and said, gosh, things are changing so much. We need to, um, to, to provide a way of living a disciplined life through how we eat, right? And, and, and we're not going to eat the things that these big businesses are, are, are presenting to us, that, that the new consumer society, which is that you go out and you buy your food rather than you grow it, Right? We're going we're gonna to show that people who grow their own food, who eat wholesome food, who eat natural food, back then there was no such thing as organic, but unprocessed food, that this was a sign that you were morally upright, that you were self-disciplined, that you could take yourself into the city and not worry about all the temptations because you were a disciplined person. Right? So, one of the first social movements was a food movement, and it was very much in response to the social anxieties of the time. Um, and another movement, which was symbolic, <laughs> was the temperance movement. I mean, the, the looks on these women, I don't, I don't think anyone was, anyone was going to try and kiss them. They had, no, they had nothing to worry about. But the temperance movement was also very much a response to social change. And the social change at this time was rapid immigration, especially from southern European countries. So from Catholics who were moving in to the cities and were getting more political power. Um, and so there was an old way of life, right, that sort of still slightly um, small town Protestant um, small business owner way of life, um, church going. Um, and then you had a kind of new way of life in the 1920s, 1910, 1920, 1930, urban, immigrant, Catholic. Um, this was very frightening to those that were trying to maintain their lifestyle and, and, and maintain a sense that they still deserved esteem and reputation and status, and it wasn't some new group. 
that was going to get their esteem and reputation and status. So drinking, what a great thing to land on, because the Catholics like to drink. <laughs> so if you, pass a pro if you pass prohibition, basically what you're saying is that lifestyle that those people enjoy is bad. Our lifestyle is good. We deserve to be the ones that are held up in our community and given, given esteem because we are temperate. We do not drink. So what's interesting about this argument is that it didn't really matter whether they passed the law. Uh, the, 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 the prohibit what mattered was that you were able to symbolically create a story that drinking was bad. And so whether the law or not got passed or whether it could be enforced didn't really matter. That was beside the point. It wasn't really about political power or about laws. It was primarily about creating a story that one way of life should be denigrated and another way of life should be celebrated. And the folks that wanted their lives celebrated were the ones who, during this time of social change, felt their lifestyle slipping away, that others were gaining traction. So the importance of symbolic protest. So this is, um, this is kind of what motivates my own work, not here, not now, not that, protests over art and culture in America. This came out um, this year. And uh, so I'm interested in why people fight over art and culture, which I see as kind of a, 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 a wonderful symbolic um, protest movement of our time. Right? This is, um, we, we hear about these kinds of conflicts all the time. And I'll just go through. So my initial interest happened when I was in uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, my first job out of college. And I was responsible. I was working with the development office, the fundraising office. And I was in charge of installing this sculpture, not making it, but just working with the artist to get it installed in front of our main library on campus. This was a class gift from the class of, uh, I don't know, class of 1986, I think. Um, Julia Balk was the sculptor from New York. And uh, Chapel Hill was not a hotbed of activism at the time. But this sculpture caused an amazing amount of controversy. So over the course of like six weeks, there were 15, 30 people outside on both sides of the sculpture fighting. So what was controversial about the sculpture? Well, OK, the central figure is an African-American man spinning a basketball on his finger. That could be offensive. Um, you have an African-American woman over to the far, it depends on your far left, who is balancing books on her head like a, like a basket of fruit. Um, you have a man and woman walking together. The man is studiously studying. He's looking at a book. And the woman has her head on his shoulder uh, holding an apple. So that's a little. Uh, you, have an Asian, you have an Asian woman who's walking with a uh, violin case. Um, so a lot of stereotypes seem to be on offer here. And I don't know how we didn't see it coming, um, but we didn't. Uh, and, the, and the sculptor had good reasons. Uh, the basketball player was to represent the university's most famous alumnus, who is Michael Jordan. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, it caused a huge firestorm. And I wasn't a sociologist at the time, but it seemed to me something was going on here that wasn't just about the sculpture, that there was some underlying unease that people were responding to. And at the time, we had a a white chancellor who, um, who had been part of the civil rights and uh, who believed very deeply in integration. And we had a, a, a black student body who believed strongly that they, they needed a separate freestanding black cultural center that would be their place to regroup in what they thought was still a pretty hostile environment on campus. So you had this battle between two different views of what it meant to be a, uh, uh, an integrated, uh, racially diverse campus. And this, I think, really um, brought those tensions to bear, right? That, that the racial issues that were underlying the, the campus at the time were kind of got, focusing themselves in part on this, on this sculpture. Um, so when I started thinking about, well, you know, who has written about this? There, there really wasn't a lot of good writing to help me understand what I had witnessed in Chapel Hill and that I was increasingly growing curious about. There's this guy, um, James Davison Hunter, who, uh, who coined the word the culture wars. Um, and we all know what that word means, because those, that phrase has been used repeatedly whenever we're in the middle of an election cycle. We kind of hear that, oh, this is red versus blue. This is, this is 
competing value systems. Um, so his basic argument was that America increasingly is divided into two camps who hold fundamentally opposing worldviews. You have the secular progressive worldview, and then you have the orthodox fundamentalist worldview. And, and the, what differentiates these worldviews is your notion of authority and whether you believe that there is a higher authority to which you must always be obedient or whether you believe that um, it, it more of a sense that people have to form their own judgments and everything is dependent on the relationships they're in at the time and that there's no single right way to, uh, to, to understand the world. So that's his argument, and his argument was that the arts were in the middle of that and that protests over the arts were really two competing worldviews about what the, art, what the arts were supposed to do. Were they supposed to be about truth and beauty or were they supposed to be about challenging social convention? And that's why we were fighting over the arts. Um, and that, that seemed okay to me, um, but it didn't seem to tell the whole story. And this is just uh, evidence that that culture war imagery got picked up early in 1992 Republican convention by Pat Buchanan who, who made the argument that we are in the midst of a culture war that is for the soul of America itself as significant as the Cold War. Um, Fistikoff, he's ready to fight. <laughs> and then there are lots of examples of other arts conflicts. I'm just going to go through these quickly. There was this large piece of iron that was put in Federal Plaza in New York, uh, and people didn't like it, especially people that worked in the building. And that become, became a pretty uh, famous national case. Um, Piss Christ by Andre Serrano. Serrano um, Robert, Robert Maplethorpe, The Perfect Moment. All these artistic protests were part of... Um, the, the cultural war narrative. So um, Maplethorpe is a photographer. Um, and in these national controversies, um, you had a range of people. Um, so here's uh, Jesse, Jesse Helms. He was on the front lines. This is um, Ralph Wildman of the American Family Association. Uh, and Dolores Tucker, she's the only one who doesn't look like the rest. So all the others have a, have a certain look to them. I mean, they really do look almost like the same person. They have big, heavy jaws, and they're, <laughs> and, they're, and they're older, and they're whiter, just to point that out if you didn't notice. Um, Giuliani, this is a big uh, controversy over the Brooklyn Museum of Art, um, elephant dung on the Madonna painting. Um, and they all come from this long line of, you know, this is, they all look like him, and, and he was the beginning. This is Anthony Comstock, and he was the one who started the, the Vice Crusades in the late 19th century in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, where he was prosecuting art galleries that distributed um, European nude paintings on postcards, right, what you see now in all uh, museum bookstores, uh, prosecuting them for obscenity charges. Um, and so the whole idea of sort of protest over art sort of began with him. Um, and if you hear, if someone refers to you as being Comstockian, that means you're crudish, which is, um, uh, I think, what we could fairly say he was. Um, and then this is Wortham. I don't know if you guys knew that in the, in the 1940s, there was a huge effort to crack down on comic books. Comic <laughs> books were going to destroy our youth. And so Congress actually had a year-long series of hearings to review the potential damage that comic books were doing to the country. Um, so the, the arguments here was that, uh, that there are these sort of national elite actors who, who, who are like birds of prey. And they're, look, they're sort of flying around and they're looking down for a little skirmish that they can pounce on and kind of inflame and use that to mobilize votes constituents to raise money, right? So you can explain all of this as simply the opportunistic activities of political and religious elites who are using arts conflicts to kind of stoke, stoke a fire. Um, another way to think about it is that um, maybe artists are just particularly provocative. So we shouldn't be surprised when people decide to protest the things that they do. This is a very controversial painting. You may not realize it. This was James Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold, and John Ruskin, a famous uh, art critic, referred to this as um, uh, basically uh, someone flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. 
So, um, so what do you expect, right? If, art, if artists are like uh, the avant dog here, um, uh, which says, uh, what I do as an artist is take an ordinary object, say a lamppost, and by urinating on it, I transform it into something that's uniquely my own. <laughs> if that's what artists are essentially metaphorically doing, then we're going to get upset by that. We're going to find that offensive, and we're going to respond to it. Um, so these are two theories. We get upset over art because elites are kind of are, are, are flaming the fires, or we get upset just because art is upsetting. Um, so no shock there. Um, but what I found was interesting when I was looking across the country at, at these conflicts is that um, those two explanations didn't explain why art might be controversial in some places but not the other. If art is just provocative, then the same provocative piece of art should provoke every place. And if it doesn't, then there's something deeply interesting and sociological happening. And this is what I was finding. So a play like uh, Angels in America, which features, um, which is a Tony Award winning play by uh, Tony Kushner, and, f and it was one of the most powerful first theatrical um, performances of the, of the devastation of the AIDS crisis on, a, on, on individual lives. Um, you know, this caused huge controversy in some cities. It, it traveled to about 250 cities in America. And in probably about 12 or 15 cities, big controversy, and in other places, absolutely no problem at all. In Charlotte, North Carolina, the, uh, the city council defunded the entire Arts and Sciences Council because, they re because the arts, the, the theater here, refused to, 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 to not do this play. Um, so it had big consequences. Radiant Identity is a, a book by a, a photographer, Jock Sturges, which features uh, nude photography, uh, including children. Um, Hugely controversial in some cities. They took it off the shelf of uh, Borders and Barnes and Nobles. They had book burning in front of the store. In other places, it was treated as a work of art, uh, and no one said anything. Huckleberry Finn has been on our shelves for 100 plus years, but every year in some places, in some school districts, this becomes a controversial book. Marilyn Manson, I don't, I haven't been to a Marilyn Manson concert, but he's what we call a shock rocker. Um, and, uh, uh, religious groups in particular find him offensive. Um, and so some places where he traveled, you'd have prayer vigils outside the arena, and some places you would not have anything. This is my favorite example. Um, Jim Richardson, uh, this is during a flag amendment debate in Washington. Jim R Richardson, an artist, decided that um, he wanted to get attention to the debate, so he took a flag and he went outside in a park and he burned a little flag, and nobody did anything, nobody said anything, nobody cared. So then he got like a uh, hundred little flags and he put them in like a circle on the park and he burned them all at the same time and nobody said anything, nobody, said, nobody wrote about it, nobody cared. And then he took up like a big flag and he unfurled it uh, down like three stories of a building and he burned that and nobody cared about it, nobody said anything. And then in Phoenix, um, Dred Scott uh, had an exhibit called The Proper Way to Display the American Flag that involved the U.S. flag on the floor wrapped around a commode and this caused enormous controversy. Hundreds and hundreds of veterans marching on the museum, people fighting over the flag in the museum, picking it up, putting it down, picking it up. Um, the, the museum was almost entirely defunded. It was extremely volatile. So, you know, this is another example. Someplace, the same basic provocative art had no, you know, hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing. And the other one, you have like, you know, the scream, like everybody is just rabid. Um, so I decided to go out and collect every case of protest I could find across 71 American cities. And, uh, and here you see evidence of my claim, which is that some places are more contentious than others. Some places fight more. Atlanta fights all the time. This was over four years. Right, so Atlanta was fighting about, had about 10 of these protests a year. Other places, uh, let's say uh, Roanoke, Virginia or Norfolk, Virginia, those are still pretty big cities. Well, R Norfolk is pretty big cities. Uh, very few conflicts. So some of this is explained by how big the city is, but um, that's only part of the explanation. There's still something more we have to figure out. So this is the question that I, I kind of went in with my book. Why are some communities more contentious than others when it comes to fighting over art and culture? Let me just see where I am. Okay. Um, so in my neighborhood, a few years back, a fraternity had posted posters, posted signs, advertising this wonderful event, the Pimps and Hoes Party, where the men were supposed to come dressed as a pimps and the women were supposed to come dressed as hoes. 
And, uh, or, and I felt that was, I was pretty offended by this, in part because I didn't want to have to explain to my daughter <laughs> what this meant. Um, and I also found it to be misogynist and racist and sort of antithetical to everything I thought Vanderbilt was about. Um, and I sort of brought this up to my class, and several women in the class just sort of politely told me I just needed to lighten up. Um, <laughs> so we all have different tipping points when it comes to offense, right? Some people might be offended by sex in the city or the Dixie Chicks when they made their political statement some years back about George W. Bush or the Ralph Lauren ads with uh, emaciated teenagers in their under underwear, right? We walk around the world and things offend us. And so we think of offense as very personal, right? It's something that we all have a different tipping point. Um, but in fact, the Supreme Court in some ways defines offense as a shared property of a community. They say obscenity, legal obscenity, is actually when subject matter um, appeals to the purient interest of the average person using something called community standards. Now, in fact, those community standards are very hard to figure out, and this is a, a really challenging part of the law. But nonetheless, we think that, uh, that offense is something that we share collectively, that we decide together what the boundaries of permissible expression are. It's not just about individual taste, but we actually get some sense of how other people in our community feel about something, and that becomes a dominant sense of what, the, uh, of what an offense should be. So the social nature of offense. Here's what I think the questions rise when you get um, an artwork that's in a community that is challenging conventions or challenging values, right? I think one question people ask themselves is, do I belong in this community? If this kind of thing is here, and other people seem to like this kind of thing, and I don't, what does that say about me, right? So that we're going back to this idea of social esteem, of how, other, how we think other people think of us. So this is kind of the classic, this, this, this city's not big enough for the two of us, me and this really offensive thing that this artist has done. Um, you know, do my taste and my values still matter? Right? Many people flip on the TV and say that to themselves all the time. You know, if everybody loves this stuff and I think it's crap, what's wrong with me? What has happened to my tastes and values? Do they still matter? And then the other thing about protest is that most of us stay quiet, right? We don't say anything. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and risk being ostracized. So one of the biggest things that people think about is whether they're the only one who feels this way. That can be a very alienating feeling, right? Do others feel the way I do? Because what I'm seeing out there, I feel like maybe I'm the only one. And you can imagine then the power of protest. This is what we call sort of the expressive protest and the symbolic power. Even if you have no chance at all in getting anything changed, if you are able to find other people who feel the way you do, it makes you feel a lot better about where you live. Right, so one of the, I, I did focus groups around the country with people who joined the local chapter of the Parents Television Council. That's a national organization that's trying to clean up the airwaves. I talked to parents um, and grandparents who join <coughs> these local chapters, and they sort of acknowledged that the genie was out of the bottle, that popular culture, television, had kind of moved on, and that they didn't expect that they could ever kind of get it back to being a more wholesome fair. But what was really powerful for them was to, was to be at a PTA or at a school, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a fair with a table with handouts and have all these people come and say, oh my God, you also think that that television show is horrible or that, 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 the, that the airwaves should be cleaned up? I feel the same way. I didn't realize other people felt that. So they had a huge affirmation that part of what protest was was finding other people who shared their values. And then this question about whether people will ridicule you or, or, or not if you speak out. Um, and then ultimately, all these questions come down to whether how, how you think your community is changing, right? Things are up in the air. There's, there's immigration, there's changes, there's economic changes, there's globalization, there's changes in the media and technology. And so the question is, where is all this heading? And am I going to be part of that? Am I going to be as important as I am now in this new world? Right, these are the questions that I think symbolic protests and protests over art help to answer. So again, going back to Chapel Hill, I think artworks serve as, as kind of lightning rods that get at these underlying social anxieties 
about the nature of change and where people fit in. So this woman who was protesting a Halloween party at a Barnes & Noble in Denver, <laughs> right? Um, demons are not funny. They're very, very nasty. Um, she may have been um, offended by the blasphemy or the um, sacrilegious nature of Halloween and of, of, of the whatever party was happening inside. But she was probably also equally um, unsettled by whether Denver was becoming a more or less Christian place, whether Denver was a place where people with her values were more or less welcome. Um, so, so here are some of the things that people fight over, just to give you a little background. I, I found 805 cases of protest in these 71 cities in the late 1990s. They fight a lot over fiction books, and that, so the libraries are a real source of, of, of contention, and school, and school libraries as well, and school assigned books in, in public schools. Painting and graphic artwork, um, pop music concerts, sculpture. So you have nonprofit, fine arts, popular culture, commercial culture. People are sort of fighting over the whole um, range of, of cultural expression. So you don't have to memorize this chart except to say that my biggest finding in the whole book, which goes along with my idea that social change is, is part of the ex explanation for why people fight over symbols, trying to sort of sort out where they belong. The rate of immigration in the 1980s, so the number of foreign-born residents that have moved into your city is the greatest predictor of how much you fight in the 1990s over art. So I just want to be clear, people are not fighting about immigration. Right? They're not fighting over immigrant art. Immigration is one of many things that, um, that would be lumped under social change. Right? It, is a, it is an indication that things around you are unsettled, that the people who you go, you're on the bus with, you shop with, don't look like you, they have different lifestyles, different habits, different language. Right? All these things create a general anxiety. And uh, so even more important than um, city, the number of conservative churches, you would have thought that perhaps the number of conservative churches would have been the biggest predictor. No, that didn't have any influence. There was no difference between low conservative and high conservative church cities, around the same number, but low change and high change was almost double the number of conflicts, 7.5 conflicts versus almost 14. Um, the other thing I did is actually a I looked at a survey that asked individuals whether they thought the government should do more to control what's on TV. So that would be sort of a disposition to protest or a disposition to try and restrict art. And the single most important predictor, more than their religious beliefs, their political beliefs, their age, their gender, the most important thing was their, um, their response to a question, do you think things are changing too fast these days? So you can see the difference. People who said yes, 42% of them said government needs to be involved in restricting and regulating what's on television and versus 23% of those who were not worried about things changing too fast. Um, and so just when I did those focus groups around the country, um, I didn't talk about immigration with them. I just asked them wh why they were doing this, what they were worried about. And almost every focus group, <laughs> someone would make a comment like this. They'd bring up immigration. They'd say, um, well, it makes it more important that we, that we control TV because of uh, they, immigrants, watch their own television. They have their own subculture, which is very strong. It influences the kids who are surrounded by them in the neighborhood and at school. Um, and it's more acceptable because it's what these immigrants are familiar with. Um, and someone else said, it's my country, and I think my culture is a comfort for me. I can go to another country, but that's not my country. Again, so this link between belonging and culture and whether the culture reflects your values or someone else's values and how that makes you feel about where you live. Um, okay, so let's move on to the Tea Party real quickly. Do I have, when is my stopping point? Have a little bit of time? About now? Okay, we'll do this fairly quickly. So I've, I've, I've also started a study of, of, of the Tea Party and trying to understand who supports the Tea Party um, with some colleagues at the University of North Carolina. So I want to argue in part that the Tea Party phenomena is also as much a symbolic protest movement as it is um, more so than the traditional kind of 
movement that sociologists have typically looked at and that you've looked at in this class, right? Labor movement, civil rights. Uh, so what was this thing? You know, was it electoral backlash? It kind of happened after Obama got elected. Is it a political movement, a social movement? Is it some kind of cultural identification, which I'll call just, I, I want you to think about this as a brand, right? The culture that the, it was like Mountain Dew. The Tea Party is like a brand. It, it, was, it was appealing for its cultural, for what it culturally sim symbolized and stood for. Um, I'm not going to go through this, um, but there's a wonderful infographic that looks at the difference between Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party. And if we have time and question and answer, I'm happy to go back to this um, just to show you how the two sides are, are stereotyped um, and how those stereotypes, you know, resonate to some extent. Um, so a big part of the, the Tea Party, right, is the cultural imageries of the Constitution, our founding fathers, three three-pointed hats, um, cost, you know, the costumes of our founding fathers, a simpler time, right? We're going to go back to a simpler time. Um, so people, um, so there's this, all this sort of cultural work, this storytelling that the Tea Party was doing, right? They didn't come out of the block with a list of ten demands. They came out of the block with a piece of theater, right? That's how they, that's how we, that's how the media remembers them, depicted them initially. Um, this is a quote from one of the rallies that uh, one of our research assistants went. It's our now and never rally because it's definitely now or never. Against the sense that things are changing, we've got to get a fix. Um, we can't afford to allow things to continue to go the way they're going. Um, so that question that I asked uh, for about arts conflicts, whether people think things are changing too fast, guess what? It's the single greatest predictor of whether you support the Tea Party. Right? So. I want to make the argument that, you know, in some ways, arts protests aren't that much different than, uh, than what we're seeing with the Tea Party. That what's happening here is that um, the Tea Party represented and does represent for a lot of people a way of life, not just a set of policies, a set of values, a set of, uh, of how to live um, that, that many feel is fading. And they, and they want to bring that back. And that's partly about, again, where you feel in, um, in position with everybody else, whether, you, whether other people value your way of life, whether you still belong, whether your values still matter. Um, and another thing that scholars have found about the Tea Party is that they really worry about, um, there's this sort of us and them, that there are hardworking people and then there are undeserving people, and that a big issue for them is that uh, um, the government, and if particularly the government as Representative Obama, is moving resources from the hardworking to the undeserving. And this brings in immigration, um, the poor, the young. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's hardworking is, is not a policy position, so it's sort of a lifestyle statement, right? It's not that much different than what the people who wanted prohibition would have said about the hardworking Protestant small town versus these other people who are not hardworking, right? So it's a very much about um, again, how you perceive yourself in the face of change. Um, one of the things we found, though, is that this is, not, uh, this is not a new movement. This is a continuation of the last 30 years of a hardening of the conservative core of the Republican Party. Right? So even though the Tea Party was framed as being anti-establishment and anti-Republican, almost all of them support the Republican Party. Um, only 2% of strong Tea Party supporters have negative feelings about Republicans. Um, and so Robert Putnam, uh, you know, has said that this sort of origin myth that they're nonpartisan political neophytes, that they've never been involved in politics and this is kind of their new, their new way in, um, is just not true. The Tea Party supporters today were highly partisan Republicans long before the Tea Party was ever born and were more likely than others to have contacted government officials. In fact, um, Past Republican affiliation is the strongest predictor of Tea Party support. Um, so here's what I, I want to argue. Um, basically, you know, you have a conservative, an increasingly conservative ideology, a lifestyle, and a liberal ideology. Uh, political scientists have found that, um, that we're increasingly 
divided by, by conservative and liberal, but that our actual policy preferences haven't changed. And we're actually, if you survey Americans, we don't, this is really not a red-blue divide. Most of us are pretty close on lots of things. But what has happened is that in our heads, in our imaginations, these two labels represent different ways of living and different, way, different lifestyles. Right? So our identifications are stronger because the brands have become stronger. This is my argument. Right? So here's what I think happened with the Tea Party. Right? You, had, you had a conservative brand that took a hit. Right? Suddenly, everyone's drinking Pepsi. And if you're a Coke fan, that doesn't feel so good. Right? So there's, a, there's this immediate backlash of like, wow, where do we fit? Do we still belong? And the Tea Party came forward with this beautiful, shiny brand, this nostalgic brand, this brand that, um, that harkened back to simpler days, that went to the notion of the Constitution. And I think it was very, very appealing to many, many people. So many people, many conservatives who self-identify that way, joined the, joined, joined the brand. Um, over time, the Tea Party has actually had to govern. They've elected people. They've had to take positions. And as they, their po politics have hardened, the cultural brand has become less powerful because, um, because you can't, you know, the brand actually, it's one thing if it's an ambiguous brand that kind of points in a direction everybody can kind of get behind it. It's another thing when it's actually doing things. And people have to say, wow, did they do, do I believe those specific things the Tea Party has, has pushed forward with their congressional representatives? Do I think that they have taken the right positions on the debt or Social Security or Medicare? Um, so when push comes to shove and political positions start to harden, I think the brand kind of gets tarnished a little bit. And that's what we've seen. We've seen, um, you know, pretty significant declines in overall Tea Party support in the U.S. as I think moderate Republicans have kind of left the fold um, and felt that the brand no longer really represents them particularly well. Um, so what is the Tea Party? I'd argue it's a, it's a backlash from electoral defeat. Some wine, way we could say it's old wine in a, new, in a new bottle. That is, the core things that they care about have been the core things that the conservative Republican bases cared about before Gingrich, right? There's a, there's a whole set of, of, of issues and concerns that have animated um, uh, strong conservative Republicans, and it still does. And the Tea Party has kind of just taken the, that, that set of concerns and put a new, a new skin over it. Um, so again, it's this continuation of a particular kind of political activism that's, you know, the contract for America was the, you know, preceded the Tea Party, but has, has much in common. Um, the other thing is not all one thing. The Tea Party is not, um, I mean, there are Tea Party members who, who mainly care about social issues, about immigration, about gay marriage. There are Tea Partiers who are libertarians who couldn't care less about those issues, but care about taxes and small government. It's not all one thing, and there's also internal contradictions, which also shows that the cultural piece is more important than the particular political positions, right? So the Tea Party are all for the Constitution in its original intent, right? You're not supposed to mess with it. But they're also for a flag-burning amendment, right? So that's clearly a contradiction. They're for small government, but they're also for Social Security and Medicare, right? So. <laughs> Um, again, I don't think it's, I'm not saying, I mean, there's just as many contradictions on the other side. My point is that it's the cultural meaning of the Tea Party that's more important than their particular political positions. Um, and then the last thing, I, I, I feel like this is kind of a celebrity movement. And so is Occupy Wall Street. What I mean by that is it didn't follow the old way in which movements incrementally develop over time. It kind of flashed on the scene. The media loved it because of all the theater and performance. It became really, really famous really quickly. And then it kind of burns out in terms of as a media darling. And so it's interesting if political movements are looking more like celebrities than they are like the old-fashioned, hard-working, civil rights, labor movements, right? Um, but I don't think it means they're not important, because I think, I think the election in the fall will very much be framed by both Occupy Wall Street language and Tea Party language. So the debt and the deficit, the, the fact that that will be talked about at every debate, is large measure because the Tea Party was able to put that on the agenda. And inequality and the 1%, right, that's going to be on the agenda in the fall, too, because of the, tea, because of the Occupy Wall Street. And Occupy Wall Street will probably never get anybody elected. They're not organized right now to do that. 
and they won't, they won't, they don't have particular political goals that they're going to mobilize around the way the old social movements did, but they're still making an impact because, frankly, celebrity movements or celebrities can still um, influence what we talk about and what we think about. So influence comes from setting instead of shaping agendas, right? So they help to set the agenda by determining what's on it, even if they don't have the organizational capacity to shape it once it's been set. Um, okay, I think I'm going to stop there and take questions. And I apologize if I ran over a little bit. Sally, you can um, yell at me in the hallway afterwards. <laughs> Well, because you asked that question, <laughs> yes, we will do this. We'll do the slide because it's a fun slide to look at. I hope it'll show up on the screen. What are the main differences between Occupy and the Tea Party? Or similarities. Or similarities. Okay. Well, this focuses on the differences. So, um, why are they protesting? So here's what Occupy believes in. Reform, campaign finance, tax the rich, tax the rich. Fraud committed by banking executives. The Tea Party is interested in reducing the size and power of government, reduce federal spending, reduce taxes. Here are the stereotypes. <coughs> Occupy, unemployed college graduates. The hipster who believes capitalism is fundamentally evil. Um, supports socialist ideas of redistribution. and un They're unemployed and they're looking to live off of government aid. And the liberal middle class American with lots of guilt, um, <coughs> equity on their homes, uh, increasing about, worried about job security in the economy, supportive of capitalism, it feels like the government is growing corrupt due to the influence of big business. Tea Party movement, you can see the difference, ties, um, sweaters. Um, upper class American, lowering taxes, then there's the stereotype of the racist who's in, interested in removing Obama because he's black. The conservative middle class that argues against the Government bailouts, um, libertarian views. I like this one. Um, so annual income, 56% uh, of the Tea Party movement um, have 50,000 or above versus only 30% of Occupy. Um, and the number's even more stark for over 75. So the Tea Party's richer than the Occupy. Um, but Occupy is more educated than the Tea Party. Um, the Occupy is actually more employed in spite of the the myth that they're all unemployed, looking for jobs, uh, because many of the Occupy are retired. Um, Tea Party is younger, Occupy, uh, I mean, Occupy is younger, Tea Party is older, um, and then clearly there's a, um, a difference. Uh, but here you see, again, political party, um, that uh, Occupy is more independent, so they're not quite as aligned with the Democratic Party as the, re as the Tea Party is with the Republican Party. Um, I thought this was interesting because uh, uh, I just think if you think about Occupy across the globe, it's actually a much, it's been a much bigger movement than, uh, than the Tea Party to date. Um, civil disobedience, Occupy Wall Street arrests, uh, uh, 1,500, um, less than 50 for the Tea Party. And Tea Party's been around a lot longer, so obviously they have different um, tactics. Um, public opinion. 54% um, agree, this is a little bit biased obviously, 50 because they're not presenting the same um, part of the scale here. 54% agree with Occupy Wall Street, 23% are, um, 20, and 23% uh, are against, let's see, are against Occupy Wall Street. 20% um, agree with the um, Tea Party and 40% are against. So in terms of public support, that's showing that Occupy is a little more broadly supported. Um, so, uh, so that gives you a little bit of, of, um, of some of the differences. Uh, I would say both of them are, are, have really used theater very well. Um, both of them are sort of cultural phenomena more than uh, specific, uh, I mean, they didn't start with particular specific policy goals that they were trying to influence. So I'd say they both are kind of a brand, a kind of a signal to a way of living, a way of life, a set of values. Um, the, uh, uh, I mean, Occup uh, the, the Tea Party has, um, has had uh, some very s wealthy donors. 
that so the, the Tea Party has been co-opted a little bit, or at least affiliated with or connected with um, some very wealthy people who have you know, started super PACs and they're kind of working in concert with the grassroots and the treetops to try and make change and elect people. And Occupy really hasn't um, hasn't become that organized. Um, so I don't know. Those are some some of the comparison and contrast. Yeah. More or less. That's good, interesting. So you're saying the uh, Occupy feeding the federal government. No, no, the investors are feeding the federal right. government. Right. Whereas the other way is that they feed off of the federal government. Uh, that's the perception of the Tea Party. That's the way they frame it. Right, so the perception of the existence of the Tea Party. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's taxpayer, the taxpayer policy, taxpayer <laughs> party as opposed to the Tea Party. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think it would have had different cultural resonance. Um, I think it would have immediately, and we have a taxpayer party. I mean, it's not called a party, but we've had um, Grover Norquist, you know, who has has made every every Republican elected sign a no tax pledge, which is extremely powerful. And from one of the, he's one of the most brilliant political strategists of, of all time. I mean, he and 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 those commitments then become really hard to back away from. So, you know, e ever since I mean, for the last. 30 years or longer, really, but there really has been a very strong anti-tax party. Um, but I think if they had come out as being an anti-tax party, um, it, it would not have been new. It would not have been a new, it would not have been a, a, um, a, a new bottle. It would, have, it would have been perceived as part of the same set of demands. So I think there was really something special about the, um, the historical references, the Constitution, the, um, I mean, I think all of that well, it may not. It may have distracted them from what many supporters wanted to focus on, which was a smaller government and low taxes. It also, I think, brought lots of attention and people into the fold that might have otherwise not have joined early on. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a great question. The question is whether internet organizations like Move On compared to um, conservative talk radio or Fox News, how they influence public opinion or in influence. Um. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't, um, I don't study that explicitly, but I, I will say that um, I think part of the, the loyalty that one, that we feel towards these brands has a lot to do with the fact that our news environment has become fragmented and can deliver to us a very highly marketed research messages that we are already prepared to receive and make us feel good about our beliefs. So the fairness doctrine, right, is no longer, it, 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 it's, you know, we had uh, um, the fairness doctrine which required network television to present both sides of, uh, of give equal airtime to both both political sides, and of course that uh, that w that uh, was taken away. So now we have we're back to kind of the way we were in the um, end of the 19th century, which was that they were party presses, right? That the Republicans and Democrats had their own presses. There weren't there wasn't an independent new news in the um, in 1900. So you have things like you know um, the Dayton. I don't know. I mean, when you, when de the, the word Democrat or Republican, which is at the end of a lot of newspaper names still, the so-and-so Democrat, the so-and-so Republican, that's because those papers were Democrat and Republican. People read the papers that were unique to their worldview. Then we had kind of, I'd say, this sort of nice time where, where we at least got exposed to a broader set of objective media sources, and now we're moving back to the old partisan presses, and I think they reinforce our sense that we belong to a particular group. And, uh, and you know, I, 
I don't think anyone studied this so much, but I, what I would like to do is I think our partisan beliefs have less to do with a coherent set of political positions and more to do with a perception of what the other side is. Right? So I think many of us are who we are because we know we're not them. <laughs> and that's really powerful, and it's very, it's, it's very cultural, but it's not necessarily good for, for democracy because it's really easy for each side to paint the other in increasingly dramatic and exaggerated and hyperbolic terms. So if what we really worry about is not being them, and then we can, both sides can create the, you know, the, the, the biggest boogeyman ever, right? then we're always going to be, you know, I could never, ever consider anything they're saying appropriate, acceptable, useful, because the kinds of people that believe those things are a certain kind of people. So I think the news media, so I'm not answering your question exactly, but I always find that if I answer a long time that people will forget the original question. <laughs> um, but I think, I think those, the, the point being that those two media sources, whether it's Internet or Fox News, are <coughs> what we call sort of narrow casting to their particular constituents in ways that I think are probably um, reinforcing the general sense of polarization we feel. Yes? Yeah. Well, and we, I think the, the, this, this country has a strong populist root, and the, there has been anti the, whether there's um, uh, the, the nature of anti intellectualism among um, perhaps parts of the population that are less educated and, and are mistrustful of those with, with higher education. Um, that, that's, a, that's a part of our populist strand, and it's been with us in American history from the very beginning. So there's always been an anti-intellectual strain. Um, and I, I mean, it shows up in interesting ways. Like, uh, it really shouldn't matter. You know, people will say, you know, I'd rather vote for X because I'd like to have a beer with them. Now, they'd, they'd be more the kind of person I have a beer with. I'm thinking, is that, I mean, we have the most complicated global economy ever. It needs, like, the smartest person possible to, to run our government, and you're going to vote for the person you'd rather have a beer with. Like, would you pick your doctor that way, your surgeon? <laughs> you know, I mean, you want, the, you want your... You want your surgeon to be to, to, to have graduated top in their class, so um, it's an interesting strain. And again, it just shows that politics is as much cultural as it is about about rational decision making. I mean, it's 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 about identifications, and it's partly lifestyle. Again, right? It's our our president represents a certain kind of person who does certain kinds of things, and we want to feel like we identify with those things. Um, and and so I, I think that's part of how anti-intellectualism sort of can get away with, with, um, with what, I, what I see as, you know, really a nonsensical way to think about how we elect people or how we think about knowledge and, and expertise. And, you know, I, I think the Internet is, is, I mean, we have intellectualism sort of arising in all kinds of interesting places, including our, uh, you know, people don't just walk into their doctor's office anymore and listen to what their doctors have to tell them. So the Internet has increasingly, in some ways, in some good ways perhaps, um, created skepticism of the experts and the, and, the, and the knowledge class and said, look, all of us have access to information and we can challenge people with information. We don't just trust what they say, but you don't just dismiss them, which is what anti-intellectuals do. You actually engage them and try and convince them that your information or your experience is equally worthy. So it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We're going to fight more. <laughs> we're going to we're going to have there's going to be more protests. Um, and the, our, the and I think the challenge for us is to make them symbolic pro so, some as much about some th that is I'd rather us be fighting over art than um, than bringing our guns to the street and killing each other. Right? So I I to the extent that there are arenas where we can actually articulate the fact that we do share different values, but we have to figure out a way to get along, which is what happened time and time again in every city that I studied, right? The, they, they were contentious. They said nasty things about one another, but in the end, they all said, we're glad we went through this process. We kind of know where we stand now. Um, we, you know, we're, we're more confident about moving forward in the future. So you know, I'm a big proponent uh, for, you know, the more protest, 
the more debate, the better. As, as much as it feels at the time, like I don't want to hear what those people are saying. They're saying mean and angry things, and I don't, uh, you know, don't want to hear it. Um, it's better that they are saying those things than not saying those things and staying silent and getting angry and getting fearful and getting worried and not realizing that there are other people that might share their ideas and that they still have a place in this world even if the world is moving on without them. Like, so we need, to get, we need to get people talking more. So I think there'll be more protest. I hope it'll be symbolic. I hope it'll be around art and not around, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard when it's around things that are deeply important to people like their race and their ethnicity and their sexuality. Like those fights are harder for me to say those, that everything that someone says is good. In art, I'm fine. I, there's nothing you can say that would offend me in that debate. Yeah. So I should answer that question and declare myself for office, running for office at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the question was, um, with all this partisanship and inability to, to get things done in Washington, you know, how do we deal with, uh, with our challenges that we face? What, 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 is, what are we to do? Where are we to go? What, what's, is there an optimistic, can we see some optimism here? It sounds pretty pessimistic. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm an optimistic person, so I want to believe, believe yes. Um, uh, I mean, I think we have to always realize that whatever we say about today is um, uh, we, ha we have a romanticized view of the past. So government has always been gridlocked to some extent, and they always seem to manage at certain moments in time to take great steps forward. Um, and it may be that it's only when we're in extremely desperate situations that they're able to act. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I guess I would say you know, and this is what, I mean, we live in a democracy. So our government is us. And so it was a, what, an odd sort of cultural um, turn is to say government's bad, government can't solve our problems, government is irrevocably corrupt, and government's not us. I mean, that, that way when you say that, it sort of says we're over here and government's over here. Well, we go to the polls and we elect our representatives and they can do, this, they can do our bidding. And so I think the fact that we still live in a democracy and no matter what our news is telling us, we have still free-thinking individuals that can come together as a community and decide this is the way we want to live. And our elected leaders are either helping us get there or they're not. And if they're not, then we find ones that will. So I know that elections are corrupted by money and, uh, and that the media is corrupted by money. But, you know, you just have to say ultimately there are, you know, 200 million people that could vote and, uh, and could change what our elected officials do. And most of them don't vote. They could, and they should. So, you know, get more people to vote. Um, and, and I think, uh, uh, you know, I think communities have to be strong. So regardless of what the national government is doing, you know, I think at our city level we can make differences. At our state level we can make differences. So I think we have to focus on where we can have power. We have to work together. We have to vote. We have to be citizens and not be pessimistic. <coughs> the, uh, getting back to the culture wars, the, uh, I think that uh, one of the issues is most of the people, especially in broadcast, are bicultural. New York area, California, and the rest of the flyover country. And the only place I've seen citizens from that New York City is when a group Yes. They make fun of the Southerners all the time. They would never say a word against any other ethnic group. Right. So Southern, I mean, we, since, since, the, um, <laughs> since the Scopes trial, right, and, and Mencken coming down, making fun of us, um, you know, we, we should have thick skin by now. Um, <laughs> this, has been, uh, this, is, this has been a bias that we've had to suffer through. And look, people are moving here anyway in droves, yeah. right? The South is regenerated. Everyone wants to live in the South. No one wants to live in the North. So... Uh, 
So they can say all they want, and they still want to live in, in the communities that we build here, and people are coming to, to live and work here. So, um, yeah, I mean, the media is, uh, I mean, the, oh, I think the, oh, I mean, and it's hard to say the media is biased. No one's ever been able to really, you have evidence on both sides. What the media is, is biased towards exaggeration and hyper hyperbole. That's all they care huh. about. So it's not that they're in favor of the Democrats or the Republicans. They just want people to buy their news. They want eyeballs on the screens and people buying their news. And so, you know, if it bleeds, it reads or something like that. It leads, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, and then people read. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, the media is, we can't, it's going to be hard to expect them to do differently. What I like, I mean, the model that I like is, is a bunch of wealthy people that create an endowment. It's called ProPublica. And they, hi they, 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 they hire 100 journalists who don't work for any newspaper who can do in-depth reporting on whatever issues they want to track. And then, tho then those um, news stories become free to be circulated publicly. They're like just any, any newspaper can print it. Anybody can read it. You know, it's an independent press corps that has an endowment that doesn't require, that doesn't rely on advertising. Then I don't worry about bias because those journalists are, are after the truth. And, uh, and they're doing investigative reporting, and we need more of that. So I think you're going to see the whole media s landscape change. You'll have the National Enquirer. Basically, commercial papers will look more and more like the National Enquirer, and then you'll have nonprofit or foundation-based um, reporting that's going to look uh, like the serious investigative reporting we've had for the last 50 years. So I've got to go teach my last class across <laughs> campus. So I've got to go, but thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.